churches all across this country right now are live streaming their service. People within the church are sharing that message with their friends. And they have friends from all across the world that they're sharing this to. So their messages of the gospel of God, their message is going out throughout the world right now. Praise God for that. God has a plan. God knows where we're at. God knows what we're doing. He knows who we are. And I'm so thankful for that. We have a, a system in place, a world, where the, the governments can tell you to isolate yourselves. And I'm thinking, God, what a beautiful thing that is because God is saying, get back together with your family. Get back together in your marriages. Get back together. And where two or more joined together or together, God is there among you. And so God is telling us to remember what our core thing is that our message is to start in Jerusalem. Jerusalem being your home. Let that home know who God is so that they can go out in the community and know who God is. So they can reach the outermost parts of the world. God is calling his church to come back to that standard, to that purpose, to that place where he is. And he's caused it to, to occur. He knows where we're at. I have no no doubt in my mind he knows where we're at. He knows that we, we are in a time of the church of Laodicea, the, the church age where he says, I wish you were cold or hot, but because you're neither cold or hot, I'm going to vomit you. I'm going to spit you out of my mouth. And he's calling us to gather again, to gather again as a people, to gather again as a church. Our societies uh, devolved to the lowest common denominator, and they remove the thick standard of God from our church, from our schools, from our places of government, from the, where we're at in this world. He, the, the society has wanted to remove God from it, so the fixed standard is no longer in place, and God's saying, go back to the fixed standard. Fix your eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of the faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and now sits at the right hand throne of God. That's where God has called us to be, that we are once again focused on him. And I, I see the panic on, uh, that's shown across the Internet and on the news, people fighting over toilet paper, people fighting over the, the things, the material things of this world, because we become a self indulged world. We become a, a world that, that sees uh, that I've got to take care of number one instead of love your neighbor. Love your neighbor as yourself. And so I, I've, I'm just convinced that God's doing that, that God is calling his people back to a, a standard to get on their knees. To, as, the, as Joshua said, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Amen. Amen. That's what we're doing here. That's why the churches are having to stream out to their, their people. I'm convinced that's what God's called us to do. There's two forces in this world that run this world, that control who we are in this world. There's two forces, how we react in life. There's the force of fear and the force of love. Love will always conquer fear. We can't allow fear to destroy your love. It's just so imperative that remember that, that we are driven by the power of the Holy Spirit, which is the spirit of love. And that's who we're supposed to be to one another. We're supposed to be loving. We're supposed to be kind. We're supposed to be caring and compassionate. I saw this uh, meme on, the, on Facebook the other day, and it showed this old, dear old lady standing next to an aisle in the grocery store, and there was nothing on the shelves, and her head was just hung low. And nobody, you know, we don't concern ourselves with that. We wait on government to tell us how to love. We wait on government to tell us what to do. Government doesn't run us. God runs us. We're the Holy Spirit runs us. He controls our lives, and I'm so thankful for that. All throughout the Old Testament, you'll see where the children of God, Israel, abandoned God. They started following the ways of society, that they allowed society to consume them, and they would begin to make laws and rules and, and uh, change uh, the purpose of, of what God was calling them to do, and then they eventually de de devolved, and God kicked them out of the land and would send them somewhere else, or God would put a king over them. He would put a king uh, to rule them, and he would allow, allow them to see what it looks like for society to rule them. And they would always call on the name of the Lord. They would always get on their knees and pray. They always had a prophet that got on his knees and prayed, and God would draw the people back that way. He would use the corruption of society, how society devolves, to draw his people back. He's doing the same thing today. If we don't see God moving in this thing, if we don't see the famine 
around the world, the destruction of, by wildfires, the destruction by, by excessive flooding, we don't, the, or the lands being dried up, or we don't see the locusts uh, that have swarmed that, the continent of Africa. If we don't see those things, then, then we're blind because we certainly see the pestilence that he's put upon us, that, that he has put a plague around the world that's causing people to fear, to react in the only, only spirit they know how to react in. And that's the spirit of fear. God doesn't call us to a spirit of fear. He says this in, to Timothy that you're not called to be timid. You're not called to that spirit of fear. You've been given a, the spirit of power, love, and discipline. That's what the spirit you've been given. You've been given the power of the Holy Spirit, the love of the Father, and the discipline of the Son. That's the spirit that his children have. And so he's calling us back to that purpose. But in, in 2 Chronicles, it says that we have to pray and honor God that we have to get back to where God has wanted us to be. And it's such a simple thing. People get tied up in, the, in the, the religion of the day. They get tied up in religious activities. They get tied up in creating a facade. They get tied up in creating uh, an image of who they want other people to see them as. Why? I mean, that causes anxiety, that causes worry, that causes all kinds of other problems in this, around you. It, you're, you're shaken. You're like a ship tossed about on a sea. You're, you're going from wave to wave. You're going all over the place. You're trying to be something that you want other people to see. You want people to see you more highly than you ought. That's the, the message that Jesus gave the Pharisees and preaching to the Pharisees, telling them, he said, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You lengthen your tassels. You put boxes on your forehead. You stand on the street corners. You want other people to notice who you are. You want people to see who you are, who you want them to see you as. But that's not the message that God gives us. God wants you to be who God says you are. If you continue to try to be something you're not, you're, you're going to be tossed about like a ship on an ocean. Just be who God says you are, that you're a child of God's. You are who he says you are. And, he, and listen to this. You're wonderfully and perfectly made. God knows exactly where you're at today, and he's calling you to be who he says you are, not what society wants you to be. In Revelation 3, it talks about the seven churches. It talks about the church age, and it talks about the seven churches. And it talks about how his church will evolve over the days. And we get to the church of Laodicea. And the church of Laodicea is what I feel we're in the church age we're in today, where we're neither hot nor cold. Let me read what this scripture uh, says to you. Revelation 3, verse 14. He says, To the angel in the church of Laodicea write, The Amen, the faithful, and the true witness. The beginning of the creation of God says this, I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish that you were cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm, and neither hot nor cold. I will vomit you. I'll spit you out of my mouth. Because you say I am rich, and have become wealthy, and have need of nothing, and you do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. And the reason why I say that is, look how proud and arrogant of a nation we've become. Look how proud and arrogant we've become to where we don't need God, where we can take him and say, you know what, God, I got it from here. And God's, he abandons his people in that. Verse 18 says, I advise you to buy from me gold refined by fire, that you may become rich, and white garments, so that you may clothe yourself, and that the shame of your nakedness will not be revealed, and I sell it to anoint your eyes so that you may see. Those whom I love, I reprove and discipline. Therefore, be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I'll come into him and dine with him and him with me. Is Jesus knocking at the door of your heart? Is God calling you and talking to you right now? Is he trying to reveal himself to you? Is he trying to give you a message of, of hope and love? He's trying to reveal who you are. Right now, our church is going through the book of Romans. And we've paused for today. But in the book of Romans, it starts out with how wonderful and awesome God is. The righteousness of God and his power is what we're blessed by. 
And then he says that the wrath of God is revealed among the days. And that when a society devolves to such a, a, a place, it, God takes his hand off of it. God abandons that society. It's really saying that you've abandoned God. Because we allow all types of wickedness to occur within the society. And then we give hearty approval to it. We give approval to the things that God has called uh, unpure, unholy. And he lists those things in Romans 1. It boils down to this. A headhunter doesn't want his head to be lopped off. A murderer doesn't want to be murdered. A rapist doesn't want his sister, mother, daughter raped. A liar doesn't want to be lied to. And a thief doesn't want to be stolen from. That you have a conscience that bears witness as to what's right and wrong. You have a holy moral standard compass because God placed that in your heart. That's what it talks about in, in Jeremiah, that he'll give you a new heart. He'll remove that heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh to know who he is. And what we've done over time for many years now is we've allowed people to stand on street corners with signs of John 3.16 in their hand, you know, warning everybody, you're going to hell. That's not the message God has. That's not the message God gives us. The message God gives us is a very simple one. Let me tell you how simple God's message is to you. Love the Lord God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. There's no other message from God. You, you know, as a, as a pastor, you stand up and you look through the Bible and you, and you want to preach a message to the people. You want to preach to the people what God's word is. And you want to open up the scriptures and, and, and dissect them and pull them apart so you have a greater revelation of what God's calling us to do as a people. But Paul said, I'm determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified, that we are to preach the cross of Christ because that's the power of God. That's the power of the gospel, that you have a Savior, that you have somebody that was holy and righteous, that did nothing wrong. He was sinless, and he was convicted because of that. He was scourged because of that. He was mocked because of that. He was placed on a cross because of that. And he died because of that. But glory, hallelujah, he rose again. Amen. He rose again to conquer death at the grave. That we are no longer slaves to fear. We are no longer slaves to death. That Jesus conquered death at the grave. Amen. And all those who call upon his name, all those who confess with him as Lord and Savior, all those who believe in their heart, they will be saved. They will be saved. John 3.16. Let me tell you what John 3.16 says just so we're, we're all clear about the message of what we're supposed to herald on the street corner. I'm going to start in verse 15 or 14. He says, As Moses was lifted up at the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be that Jesus was prophesying at that time to Nicodemus that he was going to be raised up on a, on a, as, like the serpent was in the wilderness. Because in the wilderness, when Moses had the people in the wilderness, they were getting bit by snakes. And God's healing power was to look upon this staff, look upon this staff because of the sin that's biting at them. If they look upon that staff, they'll be healed. And so Jesus uses that example. And he says, for God so loved the world that he gave, God gave, as a free gift to you. There's no cost to it. It's free for you. That God gave his only begotten son. That whoever, anyone, you, anyone, you today, anyone, shall not perish, but have eternal life, that you will live eternally. What does that mean, that your soul, the essence, who you are, the thought processes, the things of you are in your spirit, who you are will have eternal life? That's what that means. And then verse 17 is so important because it says, God did not send his son in the world to judge the world. God didn't send his son in the world to judge the world but that the world might be saved through him. You might be saved through Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior when you look upon that cross and believe. Verse 18, though, is a huge verse. He said, He who believes in him is not judged. That you are not judged because when God sees you, he sees his Son. 
Because when God looked upon his son on the cross, he saw you. And that's why we're covered by the shed blood of Jesus Christ. But here's what it also says. He who does not believe has been, past tense, has been judged already. If you don't have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you're judged already. You're a dead man walking. You walk in fear. You walk with an eye to self-preservation. You walk to an eye with me, me, me. You don't walk with an eye to Christ. You don't walk with an eye of love your neighbor as yourself. You don't walk with an eye as to how can I serve somebody else. No, you've been judged already. But here's the awesome thing. This is what's so awesome about it today, right now, at this very moment. You can call upon the name of the Lord. You can come to that cross. You can come to that cross and be saved. It just takes you coming to the cross humbly and admitting that you're not all you think you are, that you are not the great facade that you've put across this world of who you, who you want people to see you are. That you have lied. That you have, that you've looked upon a, a woman with lust if you're a man, or a, if you're a woman, you've looked upon a man with lust. That you've done things in your life that you're not proud of. Can anybody right now say they've done something, they've never done anything in their life, they've never done anything in their life that they're not ashamed of? If you can say that, please stand. Everybody's sitting. Because we all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. All of us. Every one of us have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But yet, Christ died for us. Yet, while you were a sinner, or you were a sinner, Christ died, past tense. Christ died for you. He's already died for you. He's already done the work for you. He's done everything He needs to do for you. He's died for you. Yet a man who dies for the unrighteous, that's who Jesus is. He died for the unrighteous. He died for you. He died for me. He died for the sinner. And that gift is a free grace of God that he did it. It's the grace of God, by the grace of God, that he did that. By the mercies of God, he did that. That's what's so awesome about our Lord and Savior, that you don't, have to do a simple, a single simple thing to earn him, because you can't. There's nothing you can do in your life to earn God. Nothing. There's nothing you can do in your life that will, uh, where you can do enough works to please God. You can't say enough prayers or uh, do enough sacraments or do enough uh, communion. You can't do enough of that. To earn God. The only way you can receive the righteousness of God is through the receiving His Son as your Lord and your Savior. All my life I thought I was a Christian. I thought I, I, thought I was a Christian. I would struggle, though, with the death. All my life I was afraid of that. I read the Bible. I could read the Bible. There was no, it was, hey, I read the Bible. But I didn't know God. I did not know God. And then I had, a, had something happen in my life that changed my life. And God took me to my knees and he broke me. And he showed me how uh, my life was not even close, even close to what it was to be in heaven. And I thought I was a Christian. I'd tell people I was a Christian. Before my mom died, I remember sitting at her table about three weeks before she died. And I said, Mom, being my pompous, righteous self, Mom, because she was Catholic, I said, you know that uh, Jesus Christ uh, is your Lord and Savior, right? She goes, yes, son, I know. And I hope someday you do too. <laughs> and I was like, okay, Mom, see you, whatever. And I, th I didn't know. I didn't know that he was my Lord and Savior. I thought I did. But when I believed when I believed in the resurrection, when I believed that God conquered death at the grave, that I no longer had to fear death. I no longer had to fear the unknown. I didn't have that fear anymore. I knew that Jesus Christ 
was raised from the dead. I knew it. There was no doubt in my mind. Before then, I used to wake up at night yelling and screaming at God. And after that, since that day, I've never once again feared death, never once again woke up fearing death, never once again even concerned myself with death. Because that was Satan's stronghold over me. That was his power over me. That was his power to allow me to fear. And so all I did, I didn't fear. Oh, it could seem loving. Oh, it could seem kind. Oh, it could seem nice. It could seem all these things. But until I knew Christ conquered death at the grave, was I able to love. And then I was able to love others. I was able to serve others. I was able to give of myself to others. I enjoyed that so much. I wanted to know God. I wanted to know my Creator. I wanted to know Him beyond, above anything else. I wanted to know who this God is that was this Creator of heaven and earth that gave up everything of His Son to me for me. I wanted to know Him. And when I knew Him, I couldn't get enough. I couldn't get enough of that gospel of God. I couldn't get enough. And I remember... I was, I was talking to Tommy Nelson one day, and I said, Tommy, I've got to preach. I've got to be a preacher. I've got to go out and share the word. I've got to, got to do this. I've got to go and share the word of God. I've got to do that. And he looked at me in this voice and just was, don't give up your day job. I was like, gosh, what? I've got to give up my day job. I've got to do this. Just don't give up your day job. God has you where he wants you. God has you right now where he wants you. Several years later, I, I got called to being a pastor, and Tommy blessed it. I was proud of that. I was, I was honored that Tommy blessed that because it meant so much to me. And since I've be, been doing this, my heart has become softer and softer and softer every day that the people... Every soul in this world has value to God. Every soul in this world is valuable to God. God so loved the world, every soul that he gave as a free gift. His only begotten son. What an awesome God. Hallelujah, right? That God did that. And it's like you're standing there and you're looking at this God who's already presented this gift to you. And he's just waiting for you to take it. He's just waiting for you to take it. What a glorious God that is. I, I, thank, I thank the Lord that he's given me the ability to share with others and, and speak into the lives of others, people who are hurting, people who are struggling in marriages, people who are struggling within their families, people who are struggling. And I can, I can share the gospel. I can share the good news. I can share with them who God is and help them get refocused on that cross, to help it get their lives fixed on that standard where it's no longer fixed on the world standard. It's no longer fixed on society standard. It's no longer fixed on a standard that is built to the lowest common denominator that will allow people to fail. No, it's now fixed on a standard of Christ. And when you're fixed on that standard of Christ, and that's a fixed standard, it doesn't move. It doesn't move with society. It's a fixed standard. And when you're focused on that fixed standard, God blesses your life because you're following in his ways. The eyes of the Lord move to and fro throughout the earth so that he may strongly support those whose hearts are turned towards him. He's calling on you today to turn your heart to him. If you don't have that personal relationship with Jesus Christ, if you don't have that, he's calling on you today. He's moving in this world today calling you to fix your eyes on Jesus, to turn your heart towards him. Isn't that a glorious God? Amen. I am so excited about what God's doing in this world today. I am so excited about that. Listen, I'm not excited about the death. I'm not excited about the fear. I'm not excited about any of that. Not at all. What I'm excited about is God is moving. He's stirring. He's causing earthquakes to occur in the northwest. He's causing locusts 
in Africa. He caused the whole continent of Australia to burn. He's caused California to burn. He's caused areas to, to, to do that because what it says in, in 2 Chronicles 7, 12 and 15 is that he'll, he'll allow those things to occur. He'll allow the shutting up of the rain. He'll allow the locusts and he'll allow the pestilence, the virus to consume this world until his people, Christ-like people, his people, those who have a Christ-likeness, Christians, who are called by his name, Christians, will humble themselves, get on their knees, and pray. And the prayer is, I honor you, God. You are the creator. You are the one who created the heavens and the earth. You know, I often look at, we went through the book of Genesis, and I've said that if you don't believe the first verse of Genesis, close your book. Because the verse, first book of Genesis is the key to the Bible, that in the beginning, God created the heavens and earth. Everything that's in Genesis 1, God has known since the day of creation, and scientists are still trying to figure it out. The world is still trying to figure it out. Society is still trying to figure it out. Second Thessalonians 2 talks about the spirit of Antichrist in the world already. It's in here already. And the only thing that restrains that spirit, that, that spirit of Antichrist, the fear, is the re re restrainer. And that restrainer is the Holy Spirit. And that restrainer resides in his church, in his people. That's where it resides. As for me and my house, we'll serve the Lord. I'll stand boldly. I'll stand firm in the gospel of God, in the power of God, but in the cross of Jesus Christ. I'm determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I don't need a religion. I don't need self-made rules. I don't need religion that tamps down who God is and exalts man. I don't need that. All I need is Jesus Christ. All I need is him as my Lord and Savior. Amen. Amen. Let me pray for us. Father God, your words are words of encouragement, words of wisdom, words of hope, words of love. And you've written those down for us. You've created a document that's uh, in some parts over 3,500 years old that perfectly describes the creation and where we are today. You've done that 2,000 years ago. You told us where we would be today, that we would be in the church age of Laodicea, where those who call themselves Christians straddle the fence. They're neither cold nor hot. Make a decision. Make a choice. Which side of the fence do you want to stand on? Make a choice. Be bold. Make a choice for the world or make a choice for God, but make that choice. Don't straddle that fence line because you will be tormented by anxiety. You'll be tormented by the things of this world. You can't serve two masters. You'll either love one or hate the other. Father, this is what your word tells us. So Father, I'm so thankful for it. I thank you that you're moving in this world, that you're drawing hearts towards you, that you're drawing people to you. Father, we thank you. And Father, let your church get on their knees pray and honor you and give thanksgiving to you because you are worthy. You are worthy. I am a child of God. So Father, as we go through this season, as we uh, stand boldly in our faith battling this pestilence, this locust, this dry land, as we go through that and battle that, Father, let us battle it in love you give us not the fear let us be vessels of yours to turn hearts towards you I pray this in Jesus name and all his church said amen we're honored that you've joined us this morning if you would like to visit us in person Sunday service begins at 10 30 a.m. For more information, visit us at msfbc.net. 
The Mountain Springs Fellowship Bible Church is a fellowship of believers who are caring and committed through our walk with Christ. 